It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, thanks for coming. I appreciate you doing this. Absolutely. Today, I'm so just intrigued to hear your story. You're, you're a man of many talents, and I truly believe this generation needs to hear how you got here. Wow. So, could you tell me where it all started? Well, that's, that's an honor. It actually started right here in Cleveland, Ohio. You know, I'm uh, born and raised in this city, and if you don't know this place, uh, it could be a little overwhelming. Uh, but one thing that I learned really, really early in life is that if you can make it in Cleveland, you can literally make it anywhere. Um, I learned that the hard way. Uh, I learned that Cleveland really needed uh, a little more exposure to the rest of the world. And I say that because I wasn't getting a lot of exposure outside of Cleveland while I was here. Um, and what Cleveland shows you is how hard it is to survive in America. Um, and that becomes a bit of a challenge until you see that there are alternative ways to survival besides the blue collar life we were told we're gonna to live and uh, struggling on the streets and fighting and clawing for every dollar and competing against your next door neighbor for any and every opportunity that comes your way. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of segregation in Cleveland. Uh, you'll, you'll notice the haves and the have-nots very rarely live close to each other. So if you're amongst the have-nots, you kind of got to compete with each other to, to survive. And uh, every so often, you'll find a community where people are actually kind of working together to get ahead of the curve, so to speak. But um, it wasn't sufficient enough that I felt like I needed to find another way. Um, and very early in life, I made the decision to become independent. Actually, my mother told me when I was 12 years old that uh, on my 12th birthday, actually, uh, when you turn 18, you're going to be paying rent or moving out. So that was kind of a wake up call. I'm like, OK, well, I'm 12, two thirds of the way there. I better figure something out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, within a couple of weeks, I went to work for a guy and I've had a job ever since. I got a wow. W-2 at 14. I've got my license at 14 and a half. Uh, that's a long story in and of itself. But um, by the time I was 18, I was graduating from high school, moved south to Florida. Uh, within a few months, I was married. And I felt like I needed to be a grown-up. I needed to get my life underway. And it took a while to figure out what that meant. I tried college um, right out the gate, right out of high school. It wasn't for me. I needed to sustain my needs first. Wow. And then I could focus on my future. What What year was this when you got out of I graduated from high school in 97. Okay. Or excuse me, excuse me. I graduated from high school in 96. Okay. I uh, moved south to Florida uh, soon after my first year, my first semester at John Carroll University. I moved to Orlando. And um, by the end of 97, I was married. I had given up on college, started working. And within a couple of years, I probably worked 30 jobs. Wow. Trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. But what I knew I liked was people. And I knew I liked sales. I knew I was really good at sales. I've been selling something forever. Well, you I, sold me. Yeah. Well, there you go. I, I mean, I sold penny candy in elementary. So it was like, wow. this is easy. As long as you got something that people want, they'll buy it from you. And as long as people will buy something from you, you can live. So that manifested itself a few different ways. Um, some things not as good as others, uh, but I never was big into a life of crime. Crime never really appealed to me. Mm -hmm. I felt like if there was good things you could sell and there were bad things you can sell, I can sell the good things and not get in trouble for it and make just as much, if not more money. It kind yeah. of became a no-brainer. So uh, I, I sold auto parts for a really long time. And then I sold paint for 20 years for a massive organization here in Cleveland, Ohio. And wow. uh, that's what really turned me on to the business world. And it also moved me all over the country. I left uh, Cleveland, went to Orlando, as I mentioned, came back to Cleveland, ended up in Dallas-Fort Worth, came back to Cleveland, ended up in the Bay of California, or the, the Bay Area of California, and came back to Cleveland again. And I've been here ever since. Um, and I just squeezed 20 years in about 20 seconds. And you can wow. imagine just the different cultures you experience working in Texas and California and Florida and Ohio, if you really think about the political landscape of the United States, those are four of the really um, delicate areas of our country, politically they're very, speaking. They're very spicy. Very spicy. A lot of cultural mm -hmm. um, ambitions and a lot of influences that really dictate the direction we go in as a nation. Um, but I learned something from each of those communities and each of those areas. And Every time I learned something new, I came back to Cleveland and said, hey, this is what I learned. This is what we can do if we put our heads to it and if we use the resources the same way they do. And I came to realize how hard it is to get people to change. Wow. 
um, mainly because when you're engulfed in an, in an environment that tells you a very specific story and it's the only one you ever hear, then it's the only one that really makes sense. And, you know, there's West Siders that have never been to the East Side of Cleveland in their 50s and 60s. There's East Siders, you know, vice versa. So to tell somebody that Florida or Texas or California created this awareness for me, it's like, dude, that's outworldly. That don't yeah. even make sense to us. But my little brother caught on. Mm. And he said, I want to take it to the next level. He moved to France. And he's been there ever since. Good for him. Uh, he teaches English. He, you know, he embraced the idea of vulnerability. And I began to make that my mission to yeah. teach the value of vulnerability. And that eventually forced me to make a very vulnerable decision as it related to my 20 year career. And I said, hey, this is what I want to do from now on. Yeah. Can you help me? And they said, ah, that's not what we do. I said, okay, well then I'll do it by myself. Yeah. The next thing you know, I'm looking for the pathway to start this career process. And I did. I wow. went out and got um, my ICF certifications as an international coaching federation or foundation. Um, I really found coaching to be more in line with what I wanted to do because I didn't want to sell as much as I wanted to inspire. Yeah. I want you to buy my belief structure, not necessarily my product. So when I did do that, when I finally got to the point of establishing myself as a coach, I started a consulting business. Uh, I was really looking to help family and friends first. And one of my closest friends said, hey, I'd really like to get this studio out my basement. I said, cool, let's go start a studio. He was like, fine, but I don't know what that looks like. I'm like, me neither, let's figure it out together. But I'm a lofty guy. I dream big, I think big. When he said, uh, out my basement, I'm like, okay, anything bigger than a basement is growth, right? Yeah. So he said, yeah, let's find like a suite or two or something with a little space. And I'm looking and looking and nothing really fit. And then this massive 6,000 square foot, one of a kind facility just kept popping up on my radar. And I'm like, that's way too expensive. I can't do that. But I got to make this phone call. You know, we, we have a faith within us, right? Mm -hmm. Things don't happen for no reason. So I called the guy, I said, look, you got a lot of space over there. What are you doing with it? He said, I'm trying to get rid of it because everybody that I've tried to make it available to wants to use it in a space other than what it's built for. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I want a studio. He said, you can have it. You tell me what you can afford and I'll make it available to you. And what, what, when, what year was this? This was in 2020. Wow. Yeah, so... A lot of time happened, a lot of time passed between 97 and this point. And, and we don't have all day, trust yeah. me. I got, a, I got a plethora of stories I can I have tell. a burning question to ask you. Please. You've, you've brought us all to speed on like a part of your story. And sure. I think you probably told 1% of what you've been Absolutely. through. Absolutely. Um, could you share with the audience that's listening today um, an unfortunate tragedy that may have happened to you or a close friend Whew. and how you got through it? Uh, I just want to be vulnerable here. Absolutely. Um, I have experienced death my whole life. Um, my oldest brother died when I was five. He was killed. And I can still see the look on his face in his casket to this day. It, it, it was one of the most influential things that has ever happened to me. It reminded me of the significance of relationships and the, the intensity of feelings when you lose somebody. And it got me to the point, keep in mind, I'm a five-year-old kid. It's hard to lose anybody at that point. And then there was aunts and uncles and grandparents. And before you know it, you get hardened by death. Like, why does this keep happening? I had a best friend that died in a house fire when we were 11 years old. It was carbon monoxide that ended up taking him and his whole family out. But imagine an entire neighborhood of people sitting in front of a burning house screaming for somebody to wake up. And all you can do is hear the crackling and smell the burning knowing their sleep. You don't know that as a 10, 11 year old kid, but ultimately you could have learned their sleep, they didn't feel it, it didn't happen that way, but you know that they were unrecoverable. Um, I had a, my second best friend, we we're 15 years old, ninth graders, committed suicide. Um, mm. He talked to me for four hours before he actually went home that night and did it. And it was, it was the most abnormal conversation. We were sitting in our high school lunchroom and the assistant principal came through, saw us sitting there, 
for four hours, never said a word. She literally didn't tell us to go to class, nothing. She knew that this was a troubled kid and she knew I wasn't. So she allowed me to communicate with him. And he never said what he was going to do, um, but I knew he was going to do something. Mm -hmm. And all I could do was bring it to her attention after the conversation. She was like, what was going on? I was like, I don't know, but whatever it was, it ain't good. But he was in trouble for something, and he had made the conscious decision to just accept that he did something wrong and he was going to get in trouble for it. But his cousin who was with him when it happened uh, basically told me when he went home, you know, something else happened. He was basically told that he couldn't do something that he was led to believe that he could. And it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. He showed up at the house, was like, you want to see something crazy? And he put a gun in his head and pulled the trigger. And I had to deal with that conversation. Um, my father passed, you know, I, it was one of the main reasons I came home from California. He had been struggling with kidney failure forever. And I had a son in California and he didn't really know his father, his grandfather. And the fact of the matter is I didn't really know him either. Cause after my oldest brother died, he detached himself from the entire family. So there was a lot of burning questions that I needed answered before he was gone. And I wanted him to see that. I was going to be the father that I needed him to be. And we came, and it was real, there was a lot of animosity at the time. But through that conversation that he had with me, my brother as well, my brother came into town for this conversation because we knew this might be the last one we have with him. And it was hours we sat and talked to him, me and my brother with my son running around. And we got a lot of clarity, and there was a lot of things that didn't make sense to me. But at this point, I had been married and divorced and remarried. And I came to understand the significance of some of the things that he had dealt with. So I was more, I was more understanding of his situation. My little brother still struggled with it a bit at the time, but now, you know, this is 12 years later, wow. he gets it. Um, wow. So being through all that, you, you've made it here. Yeah. You, you do inspire people. When I met you a month ago, you, you were a very inspiring, you know, Arthur Grice. You are an inspiring person <laughs> on this planet. And, I, and you piqued my curiosity because you started such an incredible thing here. Yeah. And I truly believe that we've just seen the beginning of the people that are going to follow you with the, the school that you have here. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I am. Um, you know, so, like, what's your message of hope as you go into this next season of life? What do you want to be known for? I want to be known as a muse. A muse. A muse. What's I, that? I what truly muse believe you. A muse is somebody that inspires growth within yourself. It's right. the person that makes you aware of something that you're capable of that you couldn't see for yourself. I, I thought about it as coaching for a long time because that's what my certification was. And then I really I realized it was more empowerment than coaching. Mm -hmm. Then I got to thinking about it, like it's not really either. It's just an awakening. It's just an awareness of something about you that you may not have been able to see in yourself. And I don't necessarily show it to you. I just help you realize that it's there and help you bring it out of yourself. And through that discovery process, you start to rethink, well, what else am I capable of? If I'm really that guy now or that girl now, if I can if I can get through that divorce or if I can leave that abusive relationship or if I can make do with this little bit of income or if I can turn this hobby of mine into a monetary career, what else am I capable of? You just showed me how I can do that. You know, I've been I've been, you know, succumb with debt and death and heartache all my life. And I never thought I could find a way out of that. And here you've given me a pathway for that. What else am I capable of? Wow. Well, let's discover that together. You know what I mean? And sometimes we discover that together. Sometimes I say, I think you're on the right path. If you need me, you know where to find me. But, yeah. you know, be vulnerable. And that's what I want people to do. I want them to feel comfortable being vulnerable. Expand your circle. If you stay in your circle, it'll never grow. It'll be your comfort zone. But yeah. It's only as big as you make it. Yeah. But if you want to become bigger and better than you are, you have to become uncomfortable. You have to move into uncomfortable spaces, but you don't have to do that by yourself. That's, that's what really I good. want people to take away from me. That's what you want people to take away from you. And I believe that's what you're becoming known for. I hope so. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm really honored to sit down and do this. Um, I'm sort of just, I'm cutting my teeth with this, hearing people's stories. Yeah. And I've done a lot of them in the past, but, you know, it's an honor to be here with you. You know, well, I appreciate that, man. It's know. it's an honor to be recognized. You know, I've 
I've been in life for 44 years. I feel like at some point your life has to mean something to yourself and other people. And, you know, between my wife and my children and my family, the people that look up to me and they believe in me and they, they make sacrifices for me. You know, there's plenty of people out here that do what they do because they believe in me. And I feel like I have to honor that in everything I do. Yeah. Paying it forward. Pay it forward. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. One of the greatest movies about a kid. You know what I mean? But it is literally one of the best movies ever made. And that movie's probably 25 years old now, but it had a massive impact on how I moved from that point forward. I love it. And so I hate to close this down. <laughs> I hate, I hate, this is, I'm, I'm so grateful that we've, we've begun this journey together just with like sharing our hearts and our minds and really the wisdom that you have within you. As we close out today, mm -hmm. what's something that you can, like how can people connect with you, number one? Sure. And also, what's that final message that you have for the upcoming dreamers? Sure. So, you know, I believe that you got to know somebody to understand um, how they can move you. So I do a podcast called AG's Convos. That's A-E-Y-G-E-E-S Convos. It's on all the platforms. Um, AG. AG, Arthur Grace. Um, I have my social media platforms. I'm A-E-Y-G-E-E -E -E everywhere including the Facebook page as a podcast page. Um, the corporate website is gricecorp.com, G-R-I-C-E-C-O-R-P.com. And that'll take you to all of the other elements that I've just referenced. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, and it can also help you understand who I am and kind of the backstory. A lot more stories are told on podcasts than people realize, and they're really good to listen to. Yeah. Um, but my, my takeaway message here is, don't undervalue yourself or anybody around you. You know, there is a there is a humility in humanity that I think we get away from when we become associated with social media and things of that nature. Um, but there's, there's always a message in a conversation. And you'll find that I'll have a conversation with anybody anywhere because I believe that God put people in front of us. And I know you're a big man of faith and, yes. you know, so am I. Um, I have a different relationship with God than a lot of people um, because we've been through a lot together, God and yeah. I, and he's got me to this point. So I never question what he's capable of doing for me or with me. I just want to know what he can do through me. Yeah. And I just ask that question to everybody that I meet. What can I do for you? Wow. What can I do? What can he do for you through me? And to me, that's where people really open up. Yeah. So that's my message. Talk to everybody. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it's a pleasure, you, man. my friend. Absolutely. God bless you, dude. Till next time. <laughs> Till next time. And so everyone, I just want to thank Arthur Grice for coming on and being able to share his wisdom with this younger generation. And so if anybody out there is wondering how to activate their dreams or even just understand how it is to run a business and you've been through it all, you've been in the Absolutely. corporate environment, you've, you've done the startup and you are, I see this as a success. And thank so you. I see it as the beginning of many successes. And so I'm excited to share this story. <laughs> I would encourage everyone here that if you've enjoyed this, invest a minute or two and engage with this content and Please. let's show appreciation to ag and to jojo Christ. yeah man trust me yeah. we need people that go above and beyond and create a platform like this for individuals like myself yeah. there's a million arthurs out here i love it you know what i mean so that's the only way to find them is to talk yeah well there's only one of you my friend oh, yeah, that's and I, that's what i like about you <laughs> all right god all bless right. you brother take care